edition of Retro 79 and today we're going to be looking at Saga of the Swamp Thing by Alan Moore, Top Billing and artist Stephen Bissett and John Totalbin. Brought to you by Vertigo Comics, an off print of DC uh, which was aimed at a mature, more mature audience and uh, was really like uh, testing grounds for some major major writers and artists the likes of Alan Moore and uh, Neil Gaiman artists such as Sam Keed and uh, other uh, really you know independent artists uh, artists who wouldn't be really part of the the mainstream more out there artists and uh, definitely was material that was more aimed towards uh, older readership and uh, less of the the superhero fair and more of the um, supernatural fantasy uh, type story and uh, was really really a fantastic imprint but unfortunately it was rented to the ground recently by uh, people who just don't have a clue about making comic books and uh, try to use it as as a vehicle to espouse their ideas you know unfortunately uh, instead of creating material that the people should enjoy now when it was good you know the uh, the vertigo imprint released fantastic books you know like the the sandman series and of course the the brilliant uh, preacher uh, really really fantastic comic and uh, many others you know fable another one uh, there were some really great stories that that came out of out of there in uh, you know starting I think it was the late 80s 89 or 88 and into the 90s and uh, continued on and was really a fantastic imprint but unfortunately uh, was run to the ground recently but um in its heyday you know Thanks to, to Karen Barger, uh, they released some really quality stuff. Now, this is a re-release of the, the earlier um, work of Alan Moore. Uh, some of his first work that would appear in American comic books. Uh, this came out about, I think, 1983. And uh, was... Fantastic, fantastic uh, story. And at the time, the Swamp Thing was going through a change and the the creators, Bernie Wrightson and Len Wine, had kind of stepped off the book and uh, it had been handed over to, you know, artists... Uh, Nestor Redondo or Jesus Redondo, I'm not too sure which name, I always get them mixed up, but anyway, a fantastic artist, no doubt, but they were looking for someone to continue on, you know, with this, uh, this um, unique property, because at the time nobody was really doing anything like, like this, it, it was, it wasn't your standard superhero affair, definitely far from it and it was more supernatural uh, in its um, in its content uh, the characters were were darker a lot of um, demonic stuff and, and witchcraft and this kind of thing and uh, B movie s type uh, monsters but it, it was a really fantastic fantastic book but they knew they were onto a winning thing and they want to continue that run. And uh, Len Wine called Alan Moore up on the phone. Alan Moore hung up on him, thinking it was a joke. He thought he, you know, he was being messed about one of his friends uh, playing a trick in him. But uh, Len Wine called back, fortunately, 
and uh, asked him if he could um, could jump on on this book and of course Alan Moore accepted without question you know this is a, a big uh, big move for him in the American uh, comic book scene and he took it big time you know he, he hit the ball at the park um, really fantastic uh, writer and um, book one this is this is brilliant I've been meaning to read this for a long time I did read it uh, digitally but I kind of missed some issues and it was it was um, not in sequence and uh, I also noticed by from looking at this that there is a big difference between digital and physical uh, print I was much more impressed by this physical copy uh, this being a, um, a reprint 2009 and um, reason being is just the paper that they used was uh, more newsprint type paper and something that um, definitely holds the details better and um, the colors don't look as garish and I often find uh, you know also with the glossies uh, I'm not a fan of the glossy uh, print either because the, the colors often look very garish and um, they're just not suited to the glossy paper because they don't they don't bleed into the paper they don't um, hold well it just looks very flat and it just doesn't sit well with me you know and when I was reading it online um, I, it was okay I thought it was okay but looking at it here in physical form uh, much much better and I really got to appreciate you know the panel layouts which okay here not very exciting but once you go past the um, the initial reintroduction of Swamp Thing oh, skip a spoiler then things start to really get interesting in terms of the layout the artists start to play around with um, some really uh, interesting panel layouts like here we have the panels that look like a, a building the building where um, Swan Thing has been held at this point in the story and uh, yeah just clever you know clever incorporation you know they're using the panels as a storytelling device as well but then you have like panels that don't you know they don't fit in the borders they're just loose floating in space and this is great maybe could have used the color a bit better here a bit off here but the color choices are good you know it holds the detail and um, emphasizes important parts without losing the detail as well which is very important and um, it makes something that is really detailed as this work can be sometimes uh, easier to read as well and the colors are just a, a perfect fit now it does look like a product of its time of its time you know um, it looks dated in parts but oh my god sometimes the art is just uh, incredible and um, I'm not too sure who did the the pencils I think it might be they said who did the pencils and um, total bun who did the, um, the inks over the top and from what I've heard that you know total bin would add a lot more kind of detail and um, extra things into the story into the, the pictures to make it more interesting but both, both of them did just a fantastic job and then Tatiana Wood you know her colors were, were really really great color choices i love this this blue and greens are just 
all work so well together and uh, she makes it you know, easy to digest these really complicated at times um, drawings but uh, the, just the panel layout is great look at that here you know it's one panel but it's two panels they do some really really clever things with the panel layouts and something that was very very different to what you would have seen at the time in the 1980s they were, they were really trying to push the boat out and, and go for something very different you know they wanted to make this a bit more special than your standard fare and uh, look at that it's really awesome I, I have to commend the, the lettering on this I'm not too sure if it was all done by the same letter um, or which parts were done by by the artists themselves yeah John Costanza but yeah I, I quite like um, the lettering is just great yeah, John Costanza here again as well. This is very um, Alfred Hitchcock. Very strange. <laughs> I don't know if this really fits here, but I do. I do like this. I love this. Um, this uh, this title for uh, this issue. This is really cool. I like that they're doing things like this. It's nice, you know. They're trying something different instead of their usual boring, you know. You know, like Marvin would do like this yellow border at the bottom and have like a jazzy John Mishima and or John Ramita or something like that. You know, they're trying something different and they're trying to tell, you know, show that this is a bit more than your standard. You know, it's not a superhero comic. It's not your standard kind of uh, comic book. And they're really trying something different here. But the the visuals, you know, strong point uh, for Bassett and uh, Total Ben is drawing things that are more natural, more organic. Um, when it comes to the humans, it's, it's not their strong point. There's some moments where the it gets a bit iffy, like here. I don't know, I'm not, not too fond of this panel here. But then you see how great they are drawing the monsters. This is where they really hit the ball over the park. And it's unfortunate that, you know, there are some little iffy bits here that, that does take away a little bit, not too much from just the exquisite art you know look at this here it's fantastic and i love how they've incorporated again here they've incorporated the title of this issue with um, the visual then swamp thing up in the corner here excellent excellent work tatiana wood does a brilliant job of making this um more legible for the readers easy for us to understand and without you know without losing the detail as well and that's a, the problem I find with, with some of the modern comic books sometimes they struggle with this for a while especially in the 90s was um, losing out exquisite details with over uh, over coloring uh, or with you know garish com computer generated colors this is just you know, really nicely done and she picks out the spots you know there's a good balance and uh, really works to the artist's uh, strengths so I must commend, commend, commend what am I saying uh, commend her on um, on her colours fantastic job now the writing uh, not to be sniffed at either uh, Alan Moore was just just fantastic job. I really enjoyed reading this. Like, it was hard to put down from start to finish. A really enjoyable. 
And uh, he gets a lot of stick these days because of his opinions. He's been quite outspoken about the state of the comic book industry and uh, how he felt that it's it's lost its way, it's lost its, um, its charm, its character. And, uh, you know, I feel yeah, he's, he's right in a lot of ways. And he should be allowed to express his opinions because he has been in the comic industry a long time uh, as as a fan and as a writer um, he, he clearly loves comic books so so I feel he's definitely justified in his opinions and uh, he often laments also his part um, in creating you know these type of comic books in the 90s where they had ultra violence and um, anti-heroes and, and things like that much darker and that they had lost the the charm the character and uh, had forgotten you know what comic books were really about you know from what he loved when he was a child you know and how they are no longer uh, like a, a child's hobby that they have become more than that you know it's great it's great to have these to, to have comic books held on a pedestal and to be appreciated and to have all these movies coming out but at the same time you know you don't want product that is um, nihilistic or nihilistic wherever you want to pronounce, pronounce it uh, and and um, just depressing and dreary it's supposed to be fun and there are some comic book writers out there, some Batman writers out there, <laughs> not naming any names, but who just, uh, uh, they create uh, books that are just depressing. And the world is bad enough as it is without having to add to it, you know. And I often feel that from a person who has suffered from, from, um, from depression and from, from problems like that, that it's not good to focus on the negative all the time and uh, there there is a lot of it of the books that are just very very negative very mean-spirited there are creators out there who are just creating books for out of spite they're not doing it for the fans they're not doing it to entertain anyone but to entertain themselves and, and a lot of times it's um they are vanity projects. The writers are writing about themselves. They're not creating new characters, new worlds. It's often very, very self-centered and um, a buzzkill. Do you know the joy has been taken out of it? Now here, you have all different types of characters, interesting characters, characters who are flawed characters who are interesting and uh, have struggles and that's what that's what you want to see you know and and who do heroic things who question who they are and uh, always try to find the right way and what i really love about about this book is makes you think about what it means to be human what is it to be human a very interesting thing and something that that very relevant today and um yeah it it asks a it asks a lot of questions Alan Moore puts out a lot of makes you think a lot about a lot of things but not in a pretentious way um it's it's enjoyable and uh, I really enjoyed his take on this one thing. It's a very interesting take and definitely uh, uh, cool and um, something I was surprised that uh, something someone didn't jump on sooner. But at the same time, very, very excellent and very interesting uh, presentation, uh, a version of this one thing. Now look at this, incredible. And the artists really deliver as well. They deliver this vision perfectly. A great team. Great team. 
and they would go on to to create other books later on I think uh, it's in 1963 I know a cartoonist kayfabe was watching them recently talk about that and uh, yeah just great to see them they were working they had some more books out there and uh, once things um, calm down get back to normality I can't wait to start picking up some more comic books um, definitely my, my love of comic books has been reignited by watching shows like uh, cartoons, uh, kayfabe on YouTube those guys are just a bird of fresh air and they, you can see they really love comic books as well again fantastic this is a great great panel panel layouts here all oh, shooting up at this um this angle here beautiful detailed work definitely their strong point here drawing uh, more organic and natural things as opposed to drawing regular humans um, and cars oh my god um, but they're great artists but just in some parts they struggled especially with drawing maybe a reference or two would have been good here um, but then again you know they probably had very tight uh, deadlines and uh, back then they would have gotten not much leeway compared to Oh, some of the artists today get a lot of uh, get a lot of uh, leeway. Look at this! What an incredible shot here of Swan Thing. Really brilliant, brilliant standoff here. You know, one of the most impressive transitions here. Just missed that iconic um, image, but. Um, one of the most interesting. Oh, where is it now? Come forward. It's where you have the demon. Etrigan. Smashing through the window. And then continue on to the next issue. The cover. He's coming through the window. But then it's continued on to the first page. Of that issue issue and you have the shards of glass coming from the windows everyone's looking up then you see the panels are like shards of glass this is brilliant great great idea great imagination and uh, you know they had a lot of fun putting this together and the artists have executed it just perfectly just brilliant really um, Really genius panels here. And I love how they incorporate these kids' drawings in here. You know, um, this part of the story is set like in a, in a kid's um, care home for kids who have special needs or autistic children. And uh, this demon has uh, invaded their lives and takes on the form of their of their greatest nightmares the greatest fears uh, something that's kind of been used uh, you see in a lot of stuff but um but i do like how, how it's done here and uh, <laughs> one thing that really oh, threw me out a bit um with the monster is uh he's a bit he's a bit goofy looking He looks a bit, a bit like something out of Dr. Seuss story. No, I wonder, was it was that intentional? Did they uh, intend to, um, to make him look that way? Because it's coming from the mind of a child. Who probably would have read Dr. Seuss. Maybe they did that on purpose. Um, but it's supposed to be some kind of uh, monkey, monkey king. Very strange looking thing. Um, a little bit goofy. I don't know, maybe too goofy for me. Oh, I wasn't too gone on this design, but maybe it's maybe that's what they're going for. Maybe they're trying to make it look like a demonic Dr. Seuss character. 
that's what that's what it reminds me of but then you can see here later on there's some oh, really cool image here of the of the monster as he starts yeah this is cool this probably would have came out after it definitely came out after the thing in 1982 and this reminds me of something that would have appeared in that movie i really love this fantastic and uh, there is a really creepy monster as well one of the kids nightmares that's oh my god that is that is horrific brilliant terrifying and as you can see here the um, the demon manifests itself in different ways according to the the nightmares of, of the child just brilliant yeah i love that that's so so creepy excellent work they definitely really know how to draw uh, creepy stuff and uh, i do really like their version of, of etrigan this is really cool uh, version you know despite these like goofy 60s colors um they did a fantastic job of bringing them into into the present and a character that i that i really dig really cool so overall oh excellent splash again <laughs> love how they did this foot here that's a hard one to do and uh, they did a fantastic job really great 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 shot great shot great action scene scene but uh yeah overall fantastic book well worth a punt um i suggest getting this version if you can because of the paper stock it just it just fits it suited better to this um to this story uh try to avoid i think if it was glossy i don't think it would it would capture it as well it wouldn't look as good but definitely a must have for any comic book fan just fantastic i'm not like the biggest alan moore fan out there uh, but i have to say really dig this